Hi and welcome to the second Industry Expert interview on Oxilab's YouTube channel. This time I'm meeting with Paolo Stunge, senior Go developer at Oxilabs, to discuss the concept of website fingerprinting and how it works in practice. We'll talk about how websites use fingerprinting techniques to detect not only real users, but also headless browsers, and mention important red flags that will likely lead your web scrapers to getting blocked. By the way, Paulus has his own scraping experts lesson, active fingerprinting to avoid bot detection, so our today's interview will act as an introduction to it. And to get more detailed explanations and visual demonstrations, you can watch the free lesson by following the link in the description below. Hello, Paulus. First of all, let's of course talk a little bit more about you. Uh, could you tell me more about your professional background and your journey here at Oxilabs? Sure, so I've been a software engineer with Oxilabs for five and a half years now. Uh, I started out uh, with the scraping team, uh, working on our scraper APIs, and uh, I was heavily involved in implementing headless uh, scraping in our scraping APIs. Uh, but two and a half years ago, I decided to change my tech stack a bit. Uh, so I went to our residential proxies team where I work or on our residential proxies infrastructure to this day. Great, thank you for sharing. So before we dig into the topic of website fingerprinting, I feel like it's important to define what it actually is. Could you please shortly explain what it is about? Yeah, so website fingerprinting is when websites uh, uh, use uh, gather all kinds of data from a client's request and use that uh, to form a unique digital fingerprint. Now, this fingerprint can be formed from uh, various things like uh, the headers, uh, the initial HTTP GET request, uh, could be you know the TLS stack, like which TLS versions are supported, if it's an HTTPS request, uh, what cipher suites are supported which is a whole nother, uh, TLS fingerprinting is a whole nother topic almost. Uh, it could be, you know, browser version, uh, it could be uh, operating system version and type. So, and these form uh, can be an almost unique fingerprint uh, or quite generic. It, it depends, there's ways to check, uh, but it allows to identify you, a user even if they change, uh, you know, uh, their IP address, if they access it, uh, the website from a different uh, network. And this can be done without the user even knowing about it. Uh, what about the different types of fingerprinting? Could you differ differentiate some of them? What Explain what they mean? What are the differences between them? Yeah, so in my talk, I use like active and passive uh, fingerprinting. Uh, these terms I actually made up myself, but they are quite uh, are similar to uh, uh, this sort of penetration testing fingerprinting that uh, is done uh, because the differentiation is that the passive one I, that I call is uh, basically where the client sends uh, all the information, you use only the information that the client sends anyway, targeting any website, uh, because you have to make an HTTP GET request uh, to get the initial HTML of the website. And so uh, this includes you know, the, the request headers, uh, which includes cookies, which includes user agent, which includes the IP address, uh, obviously. Uh, and the yeah, aforementioned TLS stack. Now, the active part of fingerprinting is uh, it requires more uh, of an active approach from the website is that they include uh, JavaScript code in their website, which gathers more detailed data, uh, but it's gathered on the client side, it's gathered on the browser, and it sends uh, to the target website backend. So this could be, you know, uh, the browser uh, engine and version, the OS that's, uh, that the user is using, uh, even some hardware specifics, uh, which I can get into a bit later. <laughs> <laughs> From what you've explained so far, it seems like a lot of different information is gathered with the help of fingerprinting. So from here arises the questions, why do websites do that? What is uh, the purpose of gathering this data and why is it so valuable? So uh, there are like at least three reasons uh, one can think of. Uh, so 
One thing is uh, the ability to track and identify users. Uh, and uh, like even without, uh, like for example, with uh, the European legislation now uh, that you aren't allowed, uh, that users have control of their cookies. So tracking a, a user between maybe different networks is uh, a lot harder. Uh, another thing is that uh, you can, uh, for example, you might think the most unique uh, thing about you is the IP address, but uh, I'll, most, let's say, okay, I'll, a lot of people don't live alone. And, uh, and uh, because of uh, the limitations of IPv4, uh, we have uh, many devices that are on the same uh, public IP. So uh, this allows to differentiate different devices in a household. And now with the advent of uh, AI, uh, you can put a lot of, you know, uh, the sort of um, usage data and the different fingerprints, just throw it at AI and it can figure out like how many people in your household, uh, in your household uh, and what are they like? Are you married and have two kids and uh, that kind of info? And you can, uh, if you're an e-commerce site, you could, for example, uh, figure out that it's a child that was looking at a toy or gadget on your website. So you can recommend that item to the parent's device when they access the site. And you're like, the need for secret Santa letters uh, uh, disappears and you, you can increase you know, sales revenue and so on. Uh, the second thing uh, would be fraud detection. Uh, let's say you're a social media website. And as we all know, like social media is full of bots. Uh, so, and these bots are usually, uh, these bot accounts are created en masse. And so you can detect that a lot of accounts are being created on this one fingerprint and you can delete them immediately or block that fingerprint. So uh, that's one of those use cases. And well, what my talk uh, and presentation focuses on is uh, not exactly, you know, the fingerprinting, the fingerprint itself uh, when detecting whether someone is using a headless browser or, you know, scraping data, but the fingerprinting techniques uh, that allow to gather all these little data uh, nodes and like uh, analyze them and detect whether this is a bot or a legitimate user. Mm -hmm. That's interesting to hear that fingerprinting has in indeed such di diverse applications. So could you uh, elaborate a little bit more how uh, fingerprinting is involved in blocking headless browsers? Yeah, so uh, there are, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you can use uh, fingerprinting, uh, well, the fingerprinting techniques involve gathering uh, a lot of uh, data about the device that's accessing the website. Now, uh, let's say you boot up, you, this is your first time scraping, you boot up a headless browser, immediately there's gonna be a very obvious red flag, which, uh, uh, would show that there's the word headless in the user agent. Uh, so uh, it would immediately tip off the target apps that, well, this is a scraper, so let's block them. Uh, there are then uh, these uh, less obvious red flags. So I said I would get a bit later into this. So uh, with the advent of WebRTC, uh, which is used, uh, uh, it's an open standard created by Google. Uh, so it's an API that works on top of JavaScript. Uh, which allows for like Google Hangouts to work. Uh, so peer-to-peer -peer communication and streaming video uh, over, uh, you know, uh, over the browser. So the, this uh, protocol requires you to be, uh, allows you to check, well, what kind of audio output does a device have and what kind of input because, you know, what kind of uh, webcam. And so uh, with finger, uh, well, fingerprinting techniques to Canvas, and they will decided like, okay, so we can say if a device has audio output. Now, how many people, legitimate users don't have any audio output? Uh, and, you know, input as well, uh, webcam, okay, that's a bit here and there, uh, but still. So you can detect these things and if the device doesn't have any audio output, uh, you can say, well, it's most likely not a legitimate user. Uh, then you combine it with something like, 
let's say you can check uh, like how many plugins do, do we have installed. Like for example, I think Chrome, when you install it, it pre-installs like two or three plugins immediately. The headless version will not have any plugins. So we can also say, well, this is most likely not a legitimate user. So these are uh, kind of like not very obvious, because not immediately damning, let's say, uh, because one could uninstall the plugins, but uh, still they give hints that this is not uh, a legitimate user. And the third one I say uh, would be quite obvious ones, but they include like where by themselves that uh, specific fingerprint parts are not damning, but uh, they are mutually exclusive. So let's say uh, when scraping, you oftentimes use a proxy. Uh, if you want to scrape and mass, you have to rotate. And uh, let's say you're uh, accessing a Spanish e-commerce site and you're accessing via an IP that's in Spain. So, but your server is in the US and your, so the browser reports your time zone as let's say US Eastern, Eastern time, uh, but your time zone, uh, but your IP is from Spain. So it immediately like, well, this is a clash. So things like that, or let's say the browser reports the resolution as like, a mobile resolution, I don't know what would be like 1, 2 over 7, 20, something like that. And, uh, but uh, your user agent says that it's a desktop. So uh, things like that. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you for such a detailed explanation. So now that we've immersed in the basics of website fingerprinting, how it detects headless browsers and what specific red flags you have to look out for when wondering whether your headless browser is go going to get blocked, it's time to learn how to avoid getting blocked via fingerprinting. To do that, we encourage you to watch Paulus's full Scraping Experts lesson containing a detailed tutorial on what should be done to circumvent bot detection. In the meantime, could you give us a little sneak peek of the things you will be covering in your tutorial? Yeah, in my tutorial, I get back to my roots with Python. And uh, so I take uh, what at that time were the best libraries for uh, headless scraping. And I use them uh, to avoid all these kind of uh, fingerprinting uh, techniques. Well, not actually, you can't avoid them, but uh, I. Uh, use spoofing so that uh, to try and appear like a real user uh, in the, uh, using a real user agent uh, the spoofing the resolution that would match the user agent uh, uh, spoofing that uh, I have plugins install and history length all these uh, kinds of techniques uh, and I mentioned a library that uh, helps to do all that very easily uh, in you know but covers most of this and how to test uh, yourself, like if it's working. So. Great, thank you so much. So if you are interested in finding effective solutions to blocking via fingerprinting and apply those practices in your own scraping activities, check out the presentation by following the link in the description below. Additionally, for more useful information on website fingerprinting, read our blog and watch another video, What is Browser Fingerprinting, available on our channel. And that's it for today. In case you have any questions or suggestions for future videos, leave a comment under this video or contact us at hello at oxlabs.io. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel to see more content like this. Thanks for tuning in and see you next time.